House of Ed Tech, Episode 20. Hi, everybody. My name is Karina Gonzalez. I'm a high school library media specialist, and I love listening to House of Ed Tech. The House of Ed Tech podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download at audibletrial.com slash House of Ed Tech. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing information you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and have them share their stories. The purpose being, whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. Welcome back inside the House of EdTech podcast. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad you've decided to listen to this podcast, especially if you're a returning listener, or if you're a brand new listener, welcome aboard. I hope you take the time to go back and enjoy the previous 19 episodes. But what's coming up in this, the 20th episode of the House of EdTech podcast? I have a great conversation coming up with Natalie O'Neill. Natalie has appeared on the program before. And I will be linking to her previous appearance in the show notes for this episode. When we first talked to Natalie, she talked all about how she is very much an enthusiast of Google and Google Apps for Education and all the things that she's doing as a high school English teacher uh, in northern New Jersey. This summer, Natalie had the opportunity to go to the Google Teacher Academy out in California. So I wanted to catch up with her and have her share her story about that experience as well as everything else she did over the summer in terms of professional development and what she is doing now as an active conference presenter. So you will really enjoy this conversation. Also coming up in this episode, I have my EdTech thought, and I'd like to thank edutopia.org and author Elena Leone for this episode's EdTech thought. Recently, Elena posted an article on edutopia.org titled, Eight Tips to Create a Twitter-Driven School Culture. And I am a firm believer that social media can have a very positive effect on not only professional development, but also on the branding and image of your class if you're a teacher, uh, your school if you're a principal, or your entire district if you are a superintendent or the board of education. Social media allows us as educators to tell our story. Let me throw this in. If you're looking for a great podcast about branding, uh, I suggest you head over to the BAM Radio Network and check out uh, Joe Sanfilippo and Tony Sinanis' podcast called Branded Ed over on the BAM Radio Network, and I will link to their podcast in the show notes for this episode. But getting back to my uh, my point, uh, Elena wrote a great article that talks about some strategies to incorporate Twitter into your school culture. So thank you to Elena for allowing me to use your content in this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Also coming up, I have two recommendations for you. I'm going to be recommending and talking about two Google Chrome extensions that I think you'll find very useful. And if you're not familiar with Chrome extensions, I will talk about them a little bit later in the episode. So stay tuned. And of course, I have the next installment of the House of Ed Tech VIP. And she is a fantastic VIP. So she does the title proud. Uh, what's going on here according to the old notes? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. Uh, coming up in later in October, uh, on October 24th, uh, Caitlin and I, my wife, will be presenting at the 20th annual Montgomery County Community College Technology Conference. Last year, Kate and I had the pleasure of presenting at this conference, and we presented two separate workshops that went over really well. And it was actually really cool because my wife and I were the only high school teachers that were at this conference. And the conference is really geared towards post high uh, college teachers and professors and, and the like and college staff. Um, so it was really cool to cater to that level of academia and provide content. And this year we decided we'd like to apply again. We were accepted and we both submitted proposals 
one where I will be the lead presenter and she will kind of be my sidekick and a second workshop where she will take the lead and I will play Robin to her Batman, which is usually the case uh, if you know my wife and I. Um, so the first workshop is called, and this is the one that I'll be leading, is called Stop Curating and Start Creating. And in this workshop, we're going to be discussing methods and tools for creating content rather than simply curating somebody else's. And we're going to be exploring tools for blogging as well as producing video and audio content that can enhance instruction and also your professional presence on the internet. The second workshop, where Caitlin will take the lead, is called Research. It's not that hard. And this is going to be a discussion and a demonstration of apps and websites, as well as some Chrome plugins for researchers. Research no longer has to be a tedious task. And the participants are going to learn about some great strategies and tools that allow you to put your focus on the learning and less on the organizing of your research. So we're really looking forward to doing this. And again, that's Friday, October 24th, 2014. And if you're in that area and you'd like to attend this conference, uh, I will link to it in the show notes. Also, if you're in the Philadelphia area on October 8th, the famed Franklin Institute is hosting Educators Night Out. And on October 8th, the Franklin Institute is basically opening their doors free to educators, refreshments, free parking, well, limited parking. Um, and they're basically showing off all the wonderful things they have available that you can schedule your field trips to. For example, the all new Your Brain exhibit. Uh, they're going to have some of their theater shows running as well as some dynamic live shows and some hands-on workshops. And you can also be one of the first people to experience the new Body Worlds Animals Inside Out. And this is a featured exhibit for this school year as well as Sesame Street Presents the Body. And this is all great workshops for the budding scientists and science students uh, in pre-K through grade two. Um, in order to attend the event, you do have to be an active classroom educator in grades pre-K through 12. Registration is required, so make sure you visit fi.edu to register. And again, I'll post a link to the event in the show notes. If you do attend, please let me know. And I'd love your feedback. I'd love to know what you learned and how you would use some of this in your teaching. And also if you plan to book a field trip there, I think that'd be really cool. And I'd love to hear more about it. I do have three more events to share with you, but I will hold off till the end of the episode to share that conference information with you. And again, if you are, and I put a blog post out about this, if you are affiliated with a conference or you are just a fan of a conference, you're going to be attending sometime in the next, I guess this, I guess let's say this school year, uh, please send me the information and I'd love to advertise your event and let people know about it to spread the word. So you can send that with audio, which I would prefer because sometimes I do get tired of talking, even though uh, I do get to talk to people every episode. I'd like to incorporate some other sound into the House of EdTech podcast. Uh, I'm also very excited to share some information with you about National Podcasting Day 2014. Um, this is a pretty big deal for the world of podcasting. And based on the podcasts that I listen to, uh, everybody's promoting this. So I am going to fall in line with the uh, podcasting community. And uh, please take a listen to the following audio about National Podcasting Day. National Podcast Day is coming September 30th. But what is National Podcast Day? Well, it's pretty simple, and you can help spread the word. National Podcast Day is dedicated to promoting podcasting worldwide through public engagement. You may be asking, what can I do to get involved on National Podcast Day? It's easy. Head over to nationalpodcastday.com and check the suggestions. But ultimately, the options are endless. Remember, September 30th, nationalpodcastday.com. So with that, I hope you are able to do something on National Podcasting Day. And now, without further ado, here is my featured content, my second conversation with Natalie O'Neill. So welcome back to the House of Ed Tech, Natalie. Thanks. How you been? Good. I, uh, I've had a busy summer. <laughs> I know. That's why I, I believe the last time we spoke, we had said, you know, you have this big summer tour coming and, you know, how was it? Well, t fill us in. What's going on? What happened? Yeah. You know, I feel like I, uh, I learned so much in, you know, 
two months and six states of Google education that uh, it just makes me want to learn more. So, so I thought I learned a lot, but then what it did was it sort of inspired me to really try as many new things as I could that I hadn't already had experience with so that I'm in that constant state of like beta. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty cool because it's a great learning experience. It keeps me on my toes. I don't get bored, but at the same time, I haven't fully um, like settled into oh, I'm I'm you know a world traveler now, and I've learned all that there is. No, it's not like that at all. But you got to ride the bike. I did ride the bike. Shh, you're not supposed to ride the bike. Um, but yeah, I did. I did hop on and take a couple pictures. Um, you know, the best part about that whole between the Google Teacher Institute for the Geo Academy and then the Google Teacher Academy to become a Google certified teacher was really that opportunity to get in a room with so many like-minded individuals who were passionate about trying new things. Um, collaborating with one another and really just inspiring others that was by far the best experience now is that also challenging because if you're you're not like when you're in your school you're like the Google person and now you go someplace where everybody you look at's a Google person see but that's the employee so in my school I'm not the Google person there there are other Google people, and uh, I'm just an English teacher in my school who happens to use Google. This was really a great opportunity to see how other people in similar roles are are sort of embracing technology, which I guess is is helpful to me as a classroom teacher, trying to sway those teachers who are still living in that mode of fear where, you know, I don't necessarily know it, therefore I'm not really sure if I'm going to try it yet. It was really a great experience to learn about what other teachers are using, how they're using the same tools differently, and if I have a question or someone asks me something, I now have this really advanced professional learning network that I can contact and get feedback instantaneously, which is amazing. I just started using Doctopus um, and Gubrick now that it sort of has engulfed the whole G Class folders setup, and through knowing all these people, I, I started messaging Andrew Stillman whenever I had questions. And he's a former Google certified teacher, uh, GTA attendee. And within, you know, an hour, I'm getting a response. Try this. The guy that created Super Quiz is a math teacher. There was a bug. I said, I'd like to have the option of total points instead of percentages. Two hours later, here you go. Update and try this. You know, like stuff like that is awesome. That, that's really good. I mean, when when you're making those connections and, like you said, you're growing your, your network and you can reach out right to these companies, right to the software makers, and, and you have that relationship, That that's super positive. And they want those relationships with teachers so that way they can better tailor their products. Right, and, you know, those two people that I just mentioned are, are actual educators. They're not even working for these companies. They're people that have gotten so techy that they're making things for teachers, by teachers, and that's why it's so amazing because I'm, I'm not sure what would happen if I were to just reach out to someone who worked at Google, but I'd imagine the response time would be a little bit slower. What's great with a with a group like the GTA is everyone sort of got a specialty or they've got a favorite tool or they've got something that they've really learned to love and when they share that with you just think of how how you teach the material that you love it becomes so engaging and it makes the students want to love it too that's what this was it was a giant show and tell all of us nerdy techies loving something and sharing it with one another okay so when you get there you get off the plane, you're, I'm sure you're excited, you, you float the whole way to the Google campus. Right. For the show and tell that you just described, what was it that you brought to the table that, what was your specialty? I think that the, the most amazing thing was, it wasn't when we got off the plane, it was like, Two hours after we found out we got in, we were er, er, like immediately creating Twitter groups and Google Hangouts, and we were meeting up for lunch if we were local, and we were doing Google Hangouts, teaching one another various things. And for me, um, it was, you know, really learning how to get English teachers, teachers of writing, teachers of of critical reading, 
to incorporate technology in general. So it was teaching teachers that there's a workflow that can be aided by technology, but also there's a way to get students engaged by the technology. So if you show them pictures rather than just try to describe it in an essay, if you're going to create a thing link and let them interactively click through images and find YouTube videos and then eventually get to text, it's discovery for them. And I think that's, that's what I brought to the table was that there were these tools that um, I was discovering and helping my students discover an interest in learning through that discovery. That's fantastic. How many people were in this particular Google session? I believe there was about 65 of us. Did you meet anybody interesting from outside the country? Because I know from yes. time to time they, they, they bring international people in. Yeah, so there was a good number of Canadians, and there was even a, um, a woman from Mexico with whom I shared a room, which was pretty neat. I shared a room with a woman from California and a woman from Mexico. We didn't know each other before. We were just like, hey, you know, we're, we're flying out. Why not? So, um, yeah, it was really amazing. I mean, there are people that I still talk with um, who are in Canada, who are going through their own sorts of, of um, you know, educational changes in Canada. There were people from all over the United States. And what's really cool is that we have friends or know people that have gone on to the Sydney one. There have been some in, in England, and there's some in Amsterdam coming up. So it's a really great opportunity because once you become part of that network, that network also grows every time there's another academy. So that's been really amazing too. You're my you're my my in to the secret club. So that's why <laughs> I wanted to talk to you because I, I I personally I've been debating if it's something I want to pursue to attempt to apply. Um, oh over the summer I was at a conference uh, teach me down at Stockton, and there was a session that I went to where the woman had gone. She went to London a year ago or two years ago, and her whole session was here's why you should do it, here's what the process is, and I'll be honest, I still walked away wondering what the benefit is. So since I have you, do you feel like you're a better educator because of it, or could you have learned the same Google tools and done it on your own? What, what did Google provide you? Well, I don't know that I could have learned it in that way. I find that as, as a classroom teacher, there are so many other things going on in my everyday professional world that it's very difficult to make the time. And I'm one of those learners where if I'm teaching myself and I'm watching a YouTube video, a four minute YouTube video becomes a three hour learning session for me where I'm pausing and replaying and then practicing, screwing up and then repeat 12 times. Um, I felt like there were so many hands-on activities and so many great inspiring ideas that I learned. And just to give you an example, um, one of the themes this year is that, that moonshot thinking. And I don't know if you've seen that video, but from that video, I was inspired to start this sort of 20% time project in my senior academic class. And here I am thinking I'm like, totally reinventing the wheel, like nobody's ever done this before. Hello, this is what's called genius hour and 20% time by, by other people, and it's been done. And there's this group of people that I can reach out to who have experience with it so that I'm not reinventing the wheel. Had I not gone there and seen that video and heard people talking about taking this risk, I would not have decided to jump in head first in something I've never done before and guinea pig it this year. So for me, um, I just didn't know that so many of these things existed. Also through those people, I was like, hey, I'm looking to sort of collaborate digitally with another teacher who's teaching some similar books so that we can sort of create a unit together. Maybe we can have our kids talking. Anything you're willing to do, I'm up for. And I had friends in California telling me, hey, there's a lady who works in South Jersey who'd be perfect for this. I'm like, get out of here. I had no idea. So it's sort of like these connections that you might not necessarily get because you're living in that bubble in your school district and your day is so jam-packed with so many things that this was really an opportunity to sort of spread my reach as far as I possibly could spread it. And now I know that I can go to any one of those 64 other people, post a question, and they will get me an answer, someone to collaborate with, an idea to work off of that I didn't have before. 
that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's that simple. Um, I, I have more questions. Yeah. <laughs> what was the Google tool that you arrived having an understanding of, and now after going through this experience and being with these people and doing the various activities, you now have this completely different perspective on the power or how to use this Google tool. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, it's forms. It's totally forms. You think so simple. It's a form. What's the big deal? I did not realize how much time I was wasting grading my own quick checks for understanding. Like the idea of having kids fill out a exit slip and then I wouldn't be able to address that till the next day, totally bonkers when I could create a form in very minimal amount of time and then have Fluberu or, or Super Quiz grade it for me, have it shot out to the kids really quickly and have them start using their emails. Holy cow, talk about opening up doors. Me trying to convince my students last year that I would communicate with them via email never got through to them. This year, they're realizing they're going to get their grades instantaneously in their email. Ah, they might be willing to check it from now and again. So that That's was a huge thing. that I knew how to use it. I just wasn't using it in this way, and I wasn't implementing any of these scripts that grade things for you. That's what I, I, have, uh, I have experience with Fluberu, and it is, uh, it is a fantastic tool. What was the other one that you mentioned? Super Quiz. And it's like, a, we'll, say, we'll say it's a synonym of Fluber, like they do the same thing? It's similar. Um, this guy named Ali Trussell created it, and he is a math teacher. And essentially what it does is it also allows you to personalize the message that's going to the students. So rather than just have Fluberu create that sort of stock email that's sending it to the kids, this one allows you to put in um, very specific components. So let's say you had a 50-question test or something with all different elements, you could break those elements down, you could break down how the students did in each section, and then you could even put some sort of um, supplementary work, like for example, if you got six of these wrong, try this question, show it to me for extra credit. So it's really specifying this automated feedback that's being generated to them. Super cool and super convenient. Yes. Yes. So now your kids are just being bombarded with quizzes and assessment that they get instant feedback on. Well, you know what's really cool is that we use Haiku, and I never used it. We just got it last year. But this year I'm finding that with things like Google Forms and that embed code that you can access, I can embed those quizzes directly into my Haiku page. And then when kids are absent, it's not like, oh, when do I have to see you to take this quiz? I'm generating these quizzes in such a way that they're not gotcha quizzes. If kids have open notes, they're welcome to use them. It's a check for understanding, not a check for memorization. So they can use whatever they need to use. I'm posting it online. They can take it and get it to me without us ever having to waste that time of what period are you free? Can you stay after school? It's just done. And with, with that ability, I mean, especially now here in New Jersey with things like the park, you can devote more time to teaching that content, which is, which is crucial, like the inf informational text, and you're not wasting that time. So I think the key word is convenience here. Right. I agree. What was the tool that maybe it, it, I, don't, I don't even know. What else did you learn? Well, I think that I just learned how to look at things in a different way. Um, for example, a is that, lot is this through Google Glass? Yeah, you know I can't <laughs> use Google Glass because I have glasses and I can't wink with my right eye, and I haven't ever seen the Google Glass with the left side open, so I couldn't ever use hands free because I can't wink and it wouldn't operate. Reminds me of when I was in college and all the desks were right-handed. I could have got a left-handed <laughs> scholarship. Exactly. Um, but, but continue. Yeah. Go ahead. So, no. so essentially, like, part of, I think, educators' problems is this vision of being the sage on the stage and having to know everything and make sure that everything is perfect. And I was never that person. Although there are parts of my life where I want to be a perfectionist, I also think that sometimes you just need to be comfortable with the discomfort and that was one of the things that the GTA really shared with me and hit home where if I'm making an instructional video as support for my students, 
it doesn't need to be edited. I don't need to put it in Camtasia, add a million different edits, cut things, put in all this fancy stuff. Snag it for Chrome is perfectly fine for a 30 second instructional video. So it's not about making things perfect, which is really what made me accept this whole concept of I'm gonna try these new things. If it doesn't work, that's okay, we'll keep moving. Hopefully it's an iteration and that's what was really great. I started the year this year with the marshmallow challenge, and it's that whole idea of everything is a prototype, especially in the English classroom when you're talking about what you know versus what you learn and what you understand later. When you start an essay versus, you know, midway through the essay, then the final draft of the essay. Everything is, is a prototype. So why not sort of accept the fact that you don't have to call it done. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's one step in the many phases of this project. So do we ever get to a quote-unquote final draft? As far as I'm concerned, no. I mean, I'm still a work in progress. If I were to go back and look at some of the writing that I did years ago, would I want to change things? Absolutely. Do I have to? Not necessarily. Some things might require you to go back in more times than others. Some of them are just to get the ideas out there. I mean, today we were starting the college application essay, and they're like, I don't know where to start. They all want to jump into that introduction. This is back to teaching 101. You'll eventually get to that introduction. That's not what's important right now. Let's start with the idea. I mean, Google wouldn't be here today if they hadn't started with the idea. Absolutely. And when you talk about being able to go back and revise, I... I think about my thesis. I mean, I graduated in May and I got the master's and all that, but I feel like I could open up the last draft of my thesis, the final draft, and I could continue to modify, tweak, reanalyze some data. Uh, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why I feel like with these digital tools, if it's going to make it easier for you so that you have more time to spend on the really important stuff, that's what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on that kind of stuff, not the let me waste 40 minutes talking about the vocabulary and giving them the grades when something else can give them the grades very easily and break it down for them. It's not a mystery what the definition of the word is. Rather, I'm spending time talking about how a metaphor is being used in House on Mango Street and it really represents the whole process of our lives that's something I want to spend time on. Absolutely, and, and that's, that's the most important part is what you can actually do with the students. Right. Now, let's, well, we can go back to California, but now let's come back. You're back in Jersey now, and you've brought all this knowledge to your school to start the school year. So there's two parts. First, how have, what reception have your students given you to what you've now brought back to them as a teacher? And then if you can touch on what your colleagues' reception of your newfound knowledge and polished skills have, what their reception was. You know, I think that the student thing is a very interesting question right now because a lot of us would just want to assume that because students like iPods and cell phones and video games that they're comfortable with utilizing technology in an effective uh, academic setting. I don't think that's true at all. I think that just like anyone else in any other aspect of life, as we start to become adults and experience the stressors of the world, introducing new things has the potential when there's too many at once to become overwhelming. And I feel that a lot of my students are experiencing that but you try to quell their fears by not introducing too many at once. You show them how their aids and support tools rather than a means to an end, and you take it step by step and leave a lot of room for error. Um, I use Octopus now, and I want their essays, their diagnostic essays, to be in that assignment folder, and it's due on September 9th and September 19th rolls around, and it's still not in their assignment folders. And when I ask them, what's going on? They're like, oh, I, I have it here, it's on paper, I just I cannot figure out how to get it where you want it to be. No worries, 
we're going to take 15 minutes and I'm going to go around and I'm just going to keep on helping everyone who needs it. It doesn't matter if it wasn't there on time. It's perfectly acceptable that it was late. It's the first essay. This is your first experience with Doctopus. I know that this can be a little bit confusing. So for me, it's more about I want it in that place so that I have the access to grade it, provide feedback, to them have a record of it, to use all the great things that Google allows us to use in terms of collaborating on documents, but I'm not going to stress out that it didn't work seam seamlessly on round one. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that they get that essay there, that I'm able to read it and give them the feedback, and then they can learn from it. Are you getting, uh, just because the idea of college applications and essays is interesting, also being a high school teacher, um, is their stress level increased? Are, had, are they comfortable with this process now, or are they still like scared and like we we both know it's not so bad? Yeah, you know, we actually have a school-wide initiative this year that's focusing on the stress of our students. I don't know like what's happening in the world, but it's very clear that kids are getting more and more stressed out. I mean, adults are are pretty stressed out, but there's something going on where there's just there's there's a lot of stress for these kids and they don't seem to have the coping mechanisms. So as a district, we're trying to focus more on the valuable sorts of assessments rather than the busy work. Not sending home 75 pages of reading just because maybe we'll cut back a book or two in our curriculum because now we have all of this park testing we need to get done and our entire month of March is gone. But there are other things that we need to worry about and I don't necessarily think reading another novel that they're really not going to read because they're stressed out is the solution. Instead, we need to listen to them. We need to make them feel comfortable. We need to take our time with them and work through the plans as we're going. You know, I could plan for the next six months, but I have no idea where I'm actually going to be. So this year I'm really trying to take it two weeks in advance and sort of sitting on that and seeing where it goes. And it's the end of September, almost beginning of October. I don't even know all of my students' names yet. I mean, 163 students in a whirlwind after having the crazy summer, um, I would just like to get to know them and find out a little bit about who they are. One kid actually asked me today, when are you giving us more grades? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's crazy because you've been working every day, but, but you want more grades. Um, and I'm like, oh, by the way, tomorrow. But that's besides the point. Like, I, I'm not used to hearing that kids want more grades. They've only had two grades. I mean, they did a diagnostic essay. It was either they didn't or they didn't. I didn't penalize them for, for first essay writing. Um, and then a, and a short quiz. So I think they're seeing like, okay, it's mid-September. Where are my grades? And that's something that I'm concerned about. And that's something that I think is a misconception about the use of technology. Oh, because we have technology, we're going to do more, more, more and cram more in. No, we're going to do things more effectively. We're not going to rush through it. I'm still going to take a month to get through the first novel we're reading. Just because we're using technology doesn't mean we're going to go any faster. We're just going to have a different kind of support system to do it. Now, the concern you mentioned, are you concerned that you haven't provided them enough gradable, upper, gradable assessments, or is it your concern that Hey, 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 kids! Don't be concerned about the grades. The grades will come. You know, focus on the learning as as the. Approach. Yes, that's what it is. I feel that um, they're not necessarily recognizing that all of this thinking they're doing and the discussing that they're doing. Um, I, I have a problem with feeling the need to assign a grade value to those authentic conversations we're having in class. If I'm being a good teacher and I'm asking these essential questions and we're hitting upon them five, six, seven times a class period and we're doing think, write, pair, share and we're doing team building and group conversations and occasionally talking out loud why do I have to give them a grade? <laughs> you know, like I just don't understand why exactly. they feel that I need to give them a grade. And there, what you just described, those different types of activities, there is no assessment other than maybe a check or a check plus. And, and there will be people who would tell you, oh, you know, that you can make a rubric for it, but it's, it's authentic learning and they, I don't think there is assessment for that. Right. It, it's just something you see and you take part in. But unfortunately, the more of that kind of stuff that you do, the less time to give those those quizzes or 
write that essay and have me graded in class. You know, like that sort of stuff, which is the traditional learning they're used to. They're yeah. used to doing something, being test on it. Doing something, being test on it. This is not a test. Learning is not a test for me. It's living through it. Like I said, prototyping it. What you say today should be not quite as profound as what you're going to say in three months. And we're, we're going to cover the same ideas because thematically we're talking about the same sorts of things. It's just in a different unit or in a different con context or with a different genre. The idea is we're still going to learn. And part of that, part of learning and preparing for the world is understanding and effective use of technology. I, I couldn't say it any better myself. So <laughs> I, Great job, Natalie. Thanks. <laughs> a couple of quick hitters because I remember I, I invited John and I said I only take you for like 20, 25 minutes and it's been like 45. So <laughs> I, I know your time is valuable. Uh, so some quick hitters. Uh, first, how was the rest of your summer in terms of travel and what you presented on? It was great. You know, I really, I'm still really loving Sightlighter and Pear Deck. They've both evolved and to such a wonderful, valuable way. Um, SiteLater has been working so hard to create this really great digital writing platform. It is, it's not just a, a research tool anymore. It's so useful for any teacher who would in any way scaffold an assignment. And I think being able to see it from a non-English teacher perspective is what really makes it valuable. And Pear Deck is now out of beta and into its sales mode. And as a result, as it gets more funding, it's creating crazy awesome ways for kids to engage. And that's awesome. I haven't used Pear Deck yet this year because I'm sort of just easing the kids in. But I cannot wait for when I introduce it to them. They're totally going to go bonkers. And in October, I'm actually giving my school a workshop on Pear Deck. So... They really loved Kahoot. I don't know if you've ever used Kahoot before, but uh, if the teachers loved Kahoot, I'm sure that if they get the sense of what Pear Deck does, they're going to love that one too. And you're very sneaky because now another conversation with Natalie, <laughs> and now she gives me another reason to bring her back on <laughs> to get more updates. So, I mean, this is totally fine. I mean, you're, you're great to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, aside from California, what was the most interesting place you went to or had the most fun and enjoyed yourself? Oh, let's see. I was in Maine um, during a 10-inch torrential downpour, which apparently doesn't happen often in Maine, to the point where um, manhole covers were popping up out of the out of the ground, and it was, I guess, unprecedented. But yeah, so I was in Maine for two days, and one of them was that. <laughs> so that I was. Did, pretty I did ask you what you did that was fun. That doesn't sound. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty neat for me because Maine. I don't, I've never really like hung out in Maine, but Maine is beautiful. And in the summertime, it was like very comfortable in terms of the temperature. And when the rain subsided, it was just like green and lush. And Portland is right on the water. You have those old cobblestone streets and just so much to do. I'd totally go back. It seemed like it would be a really great time. But just northeast area, New England, north of New England, there's just a sense of, of being at home. You know, like California was great. Sunny, people are kind of cool and laid back. But there's something about the northeast. No matter where I was, it just feels right. Even Maine, a place that I had never been before, um, it, it really just felt comfortable, like good people. You feel like you could knock on anybody's door and get a cup of coffee and a piece of crumb cake. Yeah, I mean, I got lost seven or eight times because my cell phone <laughs> didn't have service. And anywhere I pulled over, people were walking, walking their dogs, being very healthy and energetic. And I'm like, hey, where do I go? And every single one of them was like very, they walked over to the car, would give me very clear directions. I would still get lost because I'd never been there before. But it just, it was a really nice place to be. Everything was really clear. Clean. I felt really safe. You could just tell that people really cared. I mean, there was a downtown area where there's a bit of poverty, and there were so many people out helping. There were all of these street fairs. It just seemed like a really great place to raise a family, which was nice. Nice. So I guess in a future update, we're going to find out you're moving to New England. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would definitely visit again. I definitely do like a either a ski trip or another summer trip. 
but yeah, it, it was nice because the school was so so well fashioned, and the educators were that that were there were all from the area and really dedicated. It's just nice to go to a school in summer when you'd think it'd be dead and barren. I mean, I know when I went to my school to set up my classroom, there just wasn't as much energy. But when you go for these conferences, there's all these people just dying to learn new things and so receptive, and it's just great because in the summer. I get depressed when I go into school in the summer and it's empty. And it was so lively. I loved it. Well, so much for my next statement of, I guess there's no place like home, but you kind of put the squash <laughs> on that. <laughs> well, now everything is lively at school. Oh, okay. Um, and fi final thought, what's coming up for you here in the fall in terms right. of professional presenting? Yeah. Or what's going on? What's on top? Um, so my school's been trying to encourage, now that I am Google certified, to share my knowledge with some of my colleagues. And I'm going to be giving a, uh, during the October 13th and 14th professional development, I'm going to be giving a, a Pear Deck demo as well as a Haiku demo. Um, and then I'm also presenting at Edscape, which is in New Milford, October 18th on Saturday. And then from there, um, there's a couple other little summits, um, weekend things that I'm hoping to attend. But the big news is uh, this was sort of one of my goals after I got into the GTA. I had applied to the FETC in Orlando in January, and I found out that two of my proposals were accepted for three-hour workshops. So this is kind of the biggest thing I've ever done, two three-hour workshops. FETC is known to have upwards of 8,500 attendees. So that's really exciting. Yeah, you pretty much cemented your third appearance on the podcast. So. <laughs> but congratulations, that that's fantastic. Can you when that is, what, what your topic yeah, is? Yeah, um, so that's going to be January, right after Martin Luther King Day, that, that following week. Um, and both of my sessions are directed towards leveraging digital tools and um, – sort of like a plethora of ways to incorporate technology into your classroom, no matter what level you might be. Fantastic. I, I can't wait to hear more updates and, uh, and, and obviously get you back on so you can share, continue to share, you know, what you're doing. Thanks. So it's off to lesson plan now? Uh, <laughs> I've got some grading to do, actually. Well, that should take you, what, a minute? Just yeah, I wish. Submit and send I've out. got real essays to grade at this point. And, you know, that Moonshot project is really keeping me on my toes because, you know, as much as I want to give them freedom, I need to guide them somewhat. So I'm actually learning uh, design theory and, um, you know, stuff like that, like stuff that tech teachers would be teaching and also community service outreach. I don't want to just say, hey, go find a community service organization. I want to be able to direct them in some way. So... It's a lot of prep on my part, but I think it could be really meaningful. Nice. Oh, and, and I, I almost forgot, and I, didn't, I don't want to leave the listeners hanging. Um, are we getting ready for fencing season as well? We are not. <laughs> what? what happened? I have decided to devote my time to being a teacher. Um, now with all of this new technology stuff, um, I just really feel like there are other, other people available to coach my team um, and what I need to be doing with technology is going to take up a little bit more time and I wouldn't be able to do both well. So I decided that after I finished my, uh, my decade that I would, I would hang up my, my glove and mask and call it a day. So I have retired the fencing gear. Is there any chance we can just combine the two and you could be a sword-wielding PD presenter? <laughs> I mean, one day I might be able to somehow integrate technology so that a bout doesn't really take seven hours and it's like, you know, a tournament <laughs> is like only two hours instead of 14. When that day comes, I'm likely to go back. And I'm kind of in that in-between phase right now where uh, there really isn't a league for me. I think once I hit 40, there's a league for me in the Veterans League. So give me a couple more years and, and I might be back in fencing, in fencing mode. I say the same thing about men's softball. I'm <laughs> in between stage where I'm too old to play hardball with the kids, and I'm not quite old enough for old man Sunday softball. Exactly. But Natalie, thank you again for coming on back here on the House of Ed Tech, and uh, we look forward to talking to you many more times over this year. Great, thank you very much. And now for my EdTech thought. 
Eight Tips to Create a Twitter-Driven School Culture. The information you're about to hear originally appeared on edutopia.org in an article by Elena Leone. You can find Ms. Leone online at www.elenaleone.com, and that's E-L-A-N-A-L-E-O-N-I.com. And Elena is also on Twitter, and her handle is Elena Leone, the same as her website. Twitter is one of the most powerful tools that you can use for your professional development, and this is not a new topic to the podcast. It's established that hundreds of thousands of educators around the world are currently using Twitter to connect, share, and collaborate. While it's fantastic that educators are flocking to Twitter, many of them still feel even more alone and isolated within their own school and district. There's an unfortunate inverse trend that's been noticed in education. The more connected you are on Twitter, the less support and collaboration you tend to have within your school. Why can't we have both? Why can't we be connected virtually and face-to-face? What's stopping us from using Twitter to support and collaborate with our colleagues? Although many of you teach in rooms with closed doors, there is no reason not to connect with your colleagues through Twitter. Here's how administrators can help move this needle. Number one, model it first. Number two, display your Twitter handle. Number three, offer real-time encouragement. Number four, Transform your faculty lounge. Number five, encourage back channels. Number six, create a speaker series. Number seven, conduct a Twitter chat for staff to participate in. And number eight, create a Twitter team. Now let's go back through these one by one with a little bit more information. So the first one, modeling Twitter. First and foremost, you need to model the change you want to see in your school. It never works to just tell people to do something that you don't want to or are too scared to do yourself. Remember, you're going to make mistakes. Don't get down on yourself. Embrace the mistakes and tweet on. The second one, display your Twitter handle. It may sound simple, but make sure you add your at username on Twitter to your email signature, your voicemail, and your school website. As a general rule of thumb, Wherever you list your phone number or email, display your Twitter handle. Number three, offer real-time encouragement. Take a minute or two out of your day and scan your staff's tweets. Favorite, reply to, and retweet them to show public encouragement. And that you're actually looking at them and it's valuable. Number four, transform your faculty lounge. Display the real-time flow of tweets from your staff or school hashtag on a screen. If this is a hit, consider doing it other places within your school. There are many cool and somewhat free services that display hashtags. Check out TweetBeam, Visible Tweets, or Twitterfall, three excellent websites for displaying tweets. Number five, encourage back channels. During meetings and professional development sessions, encourage your staff to use Twitter as a back channel. If you're not sure what a back channel is, I have linked to my episode where I talk about back channeling in the classroom in the show notes. And remember to also model this. Be an active participant in the back channel during these meetings and sessions. Number six, create a speaker series. Invite guests in person or virtually to talk about the power of Twitter. Sometimes the adoption of new technology can only work when people hear it from others in their position and from people that they admire. Number seven, conduct a Twitter chat for staff to participate in. Twitter chats are a great way to get your staff to collaborate in real time around specific themes or questions. Pick a day of the week and a time and let your staff know about the chat. And a great tip to go along with this, make sure from time to time or even every week, your staff picks the topic of discussion. Number eight, Create a Twitter team. You can't do this all alone. Recruit a team and meet with them regularly to do things like surveying the staff. Information is powerful. As a first step, you may want to create a quick survey to see how many people in your building are either currently using Twitter or have an interest in using Twitter. Then ask about their specific challenges or concerns. Make sure to read their answers, provide support, and address their concerns. Provide incentives. This is a fun part. 
Here's some ideas. Highlight the most improved Twitter user at an assembly or a school gathering. Have a friendly competition with clout scores or for the person who collaborates and helps others in your school or district the most. This can be measured by replies and also with the use of a school hashtag. And you can simply tweet a follow Friday using the hashtag FF that recognizes specific staff on Twitter or highlight staff in your internal newsletter or your website. And the last one for creating a Twitter team, work with local businesses to donate products. The more staff members tweet using a specific school hashtag, the more eligible they could become to win the prize. This can be weekly, monthly, or even quarterly. Now, these are not by any means all of the things you can do to create a more connected culture in your school. Try some of them, try all of them, or try something new. Just make sure to share what you're up to in the comments on this episode or the other ways that you can reach me. You can also connect with me on Twitter, duh. And uh, here's a quote from Adam Bello, who once said, quote, not sharing is selfish. Make sure you tell your story. It might just inspire others to do the same. And I do want to give special thanks to Ms. Leone for writing a fantastic article with all of the preceding awesome ideas of how you can create a enhanced Twitter-driven school culture. And that's my EdTech thought. This episode's EdTech recommendation is all about Google Chrome. And today I'd like to talk to you about two Google Chrome extensions. Now, first, if you're not familiar with Google Chrome extensions, they basically add additional functionality and usability to the Google Chrome browser. They're fantastic, and there are millions of extensions and add-ons for the Chrome browser. But today I'd like to talk about two that I really enjoy. The first is called TLDR, and that stands for, you guessed it, Too Long Didn't Read. This is a free extension that creates a summary of any web article without leaving the original page. It's really cool to be able to get a summary of the article you're reading. So let's take a quick listen to some audio from the TLDR extension. Our TLDR plugin has been called the greatest thing since sliced bread. Granted, our CTO, Brandon Words, called it that because usually you don't want the whole loaf of bread, just a couple of slices. It's the same way with our plugin. Sometimes you want a taste of an article, not the whole thing. Here's how it works. Just browse to any article on the web. Here's something rather interesting from Ars Technica. Let's have a look. Yep, long article. Here's how we can help. Our plugin can give you just a short summary to help you quickly decide if you really want to read the whole thing. Now that you have the short summary from our super smart sloth, you can also have a look at three other versions. A short version where we try to reduce the content down to about 25% of the original length. A medium version that's about half the original article's length. And yes, you guessed it, the long version is about 75% of the original length. The web's an imperfect place, and sometimes webmasters will use odd HTML that confuses our sloth. No worries. Just highlight the copy you want to TLDR, right-click, and there you have it. Turns out this was a great subject, and our plugin helped you get a quick grasp. But now your interest is peaked, and you want more like it. Just click the Find More Like This button, and our language heuristics engine analyzes the content for some really amazing search results. All of this is possible because of our groundbreaking language heuristics engine, Liquid Helium. It powers all of our products and applications. We hope you enjoy our plugin as much as we enjoy bringing it to you. Visit Strimmer.com to stay up to date with our latest offerings that feature the incredible power of Liquid Helium. And the second Google Chrome extension I'd like to talk about today is called Split Screen. It prompts the user for two URL addresses and then displays both web pages in one Chrome tab. This is really cool. By default, when you open it, 
The left side will have a blank text canvas that you can type anything on, and the text will save till you delete it or change it. So you actually have the ability to say, watch a video on the right hand side and take notes on it on the left hand side. And let's say you have to stop that video and come back to it. It will save your notes by default, which is really cool. So check out split screen and check out TLDR. And that's my EdTech recommendation. And now let's meet the House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to Natalie Franzi. Natalie is a passionate, lifelong learner who enjoys to explore the world of education. Natalie is a former 7th grade reading teacher here in New Jersey and has also previously taught special education in an inclusive elementary setting. Natalie recently graduated from a five-year master's program from the College of New Jersey, majoring in special education with a concentration in literacy. She is also a fellow Caldwell University alumni, and we graduated together from Caldwell University, where she earned a second master's degree in education administration. Not only does Natalie hold seven educational certificates, but she is also a Google educator and a Smart Notebook certified trainer. Natalie has also been an active member of NJASCD's Northern Region, where she currently holds the position of secretary. She is also a member of EdCamp New Jersey, coming up on November 22nd, 2014. Natalie has previously presented on Common Core, English Language Arts, Smart Notebook, Google Drive, the Danielson Framework for Teaching, QR Codes, Co-Teaching, and free and elective apps and websites. In Natalie's spare time, she enjoys volunteering for the Special Olympics of New Jersey. She has been an active volunteer for the past 10 years and has had the privilege of serving on the official games committee for the 2014 USA Games, which were recently held here in New Jersey. Natalie also enjoys traveling and photography. You can follow Natalie on Twitter, as I recommend that you do, and her user username is Natalie Franzi, N-A-T-A-L-I-E-F-R-A-N-Z-I, and she also blogs at natalieFranzi.blogspot.com. Congratulations, Natalie. Keep up the great work. You are the House of Ed Tech VIP. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Once again, I am Christopher Nessie. As always, I ask that you keep the conversation going and go check over my website at Mr. .chrisnessy.com. You could check out the show notes for this episode. Again, this is episode number 20. If you have questions or comments, I 100% welcome and encourage your feedback. There are a number of ways to share your thoughts. First, you can simply leave a comment on the show notes for this episode. Uh, if you'd like, you can also leave audio feedback. And to do that, you can click the speak pipe button on the website. You can also call the House of Ed Tech listener feedback line. And that number is 732-903-4869. And you can connect with me on Voxer. I am cnessie4602. And you can email me. The email is feedback at chrisnessie.com. And you can also connect with me on Twitter. My username is Mr. Nessie, M-R-N-E-S-I. And use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. If you enjoyed the House of Ed Tech, I'd like you to do two things. Number one, first please rate and review the podcast in iTunes. Five-star ratings and positive reviews help keep the House of Ed Tech front and center for other teachers and really anybody else who's interested in this content to discover and enjoy. A special thank you to, and this is the username, Juliet's Dad, who left some really great feedback for me recently. So thank you to Juliet's Dad. Glad you enjoy the program, and I look forward to having you as a listener here on the House of Ed Tech. Number two, please tell somebody else about the show face-to-face. -face. Let them know what I'm doing here, what you're getting out of it, and how it might benefit them to be a subscriber to the podcast. So thank you very much for spreading the word. I want to help as many people as possible. As I said at the beginning of the episode, there are three awesome PD opportunities coming up if you are in the central New Jersey area, 
and the following events are all being sponsored by the Edison Township Public Schools. Thank you to former House of EdTech VIP, Steve Figarelli, and he's Mr. Figarelli, F-I-G-U-R-E-L-L-I on Twitter, for sending these my way to share with you. The first, really quickly, on October 1st from 4.30 to 6 at Edison High School, Dr. Edmund Dixon is going to be speaking about helping boys to learn. For more information, you can go to helpingboyslearn.com slash HBL slash Edison. The second, the famed teacher pirate Dave Burgess is going to be appearing at J.P. Stevens High School on Saturday, October 8th from 8.30 to 12, and he is going to be presenting his Teach Like a Pirate program. For more information, you can go to smore.com slash ASNTD for more information and to purchase tickets. And coming up in January on the 31st, 2015, EdTech NJ will be taking place also at J.P. Stevens High School. For updates for this awesome conference, which I presented at last year, go to edtechnj.com and also follow edtechnj on Twitter. My good friend Eric Scheninger reached out to me and asked me to spread the word about the Edscape conference, which is taking place at New Milford High School on Saturday, October 18th. The cost is only $35 for a full day of learning from some of the most talented teachers in New Jersey and beyond. Visit edscapeconference.com for more information and to register. Uh, Before we close this out, again, I have been speaking to some amazing educators and tech people, and I can't wait to share these conversations with you in the future. So come on back to the house when I release episode number 21 on October 12th, 2014. When I share my conversation with Casey Bell, a tech integration specialist from the great state of Texas, and shakeuplearning.com. I'm also coming up, speaking of numbered episodes, on the one-year anniversary slash birthday of me podcasting and the House of Ed Tech. Episode 26 is a milestone for the show in my mind. With that, I've decided that for number 26, I would like to turn the show over to you, the listeners. It's all about you in number 26. And what I'm looking for is to have you participate in the first annual House of EdTech Smackdown. I'd like to feature 26 tools, apps, websites, etc. that you find useful in your teaching. When you think of them, or you want to suggest something, email me your contribution, and I would prefer that you send me some audio. I mean, I could read 26 different emails, but I think it would add something to the program if you take the time to send me some audio. You can use the feedback hotline, and you can also email me an MP3, and send me something that's two minutes or less and talk about a tech tool that you think is awesome and would like to share with the House of EdTech community. Be sure to let me know some information about yourself, your name, where you're from. Plug yourself a little bit in your audio clip. I look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. Give it a try.